I'm just going to go over what I've talked about, and some of it's going to be some new material, but I'm going to start kind of right in the middle of uh, Odin reclaiming the meat of inspiration, because I think there's some points there that I, that I missed. Are we record, Melissa? Are we ready? Okay, good deal. We, uh, we're going to start this evening where, we, where Odin comes upon the, the men that belong to Sutting, Suttinger. Or, or, no, it's not Suttinger, it's, it's Baugi. Um, he comes upon nine men working in the field. And he's in, on a mission to recollect this meat of inspiration that was made from Kovacir's blood. Because this was a, it's a real loss and it's a real threat. And it wasn't treated properly. The, uh, the possession of the mead became the most important aspect instead of using the mead. Instead of actually uh, becoming inspired by it, it simply became a possession to hold. And uh, Bragi answered, the tale runs thus, Odin departed from home and came to a certain place where nine feralls were mowing hay. He asked if they desired him to wet their scythes and they assented. Then he took a hone from his belt and wetted the scythes. It seemed to them that the scythes cut better by far and they asked that the home be sold them. But he put such a value on it that whoso desired to buy it must give a considerable price. Nonetheless, all said that they would agree and prayed him to sell it to them. He cast the hone up into the air, but since all wished to lay their hands on it, they became so intermingled with one another that each struck with his scythe against the other's neck. Such is the way of many men. In their struggles to one-up each other, they believe it is an object that will sharpen a tool which they hold that will make them better. The tool and the object are both items are distinct and separate from the man himself. And it's an odd turn on the idea that something out there will make me better in here. And we've been taught to think that this higher standard or state of being might be accomplished by some possession. We are, it's bombarded on us all the time. We see it every night on television. We hear it preached from the pulpit in far too many churches. And this mindset of need is made all the more acceptable when permission is given to seek it from the divine. Ask and it shall be given, all that nonsense. As if it's okay to find the value of who we are in something we own instead of something we become, we are our deeds. See, that if you ask it from the divine, well, there could be no fault in the origin of that. That perhaps God gave them one special gift so that they might be better than the next fellow. That's 180 degrees from what most of Ossetru is. Ossetru is us understanding that some of the things we're going to have to do to become the men and women that we want to be is going to require some effort. Nobody's going to come and hand it to us. We're going to have to take the gifts that we possess and go out there and make a mark in the world. Not because we think we have the right amount of books. Not because we think we own something, um, but because we are something. That means we have to start looking inside. And that's a real challenge because when you live in a society that suggests that our ego might make us more important than we really are, how do we disarm that? How do we come to grips with the idea that, well, maybe I need to be something better. And we see the most successful examples of that all over social media. But believe you me, people will cut your throat in a heartbeat to ensure everyone knows how much more special they are than you. And this particularly acute manifestation of uniqueness, which is what I call it, when we hear the terms, the gods call who they will. And an exception is made to whom one allows into their tribe. The messianic overtones are awfully hard to resist. Everyone wants to belong to something true, real, and powerful. But when this is challenged, it is usually perceived as hateful, or it's a challenge to their ego. Are they being true to themselves? Well, what business business is it of anyone's? Is it worth our while to seek out and cultivate and harvest a sense of our own importance by reacting to something outside of our control? Absolutely not. You see, it means we have once, if we fall into that trap of getting upset because somebody did something we don't like, it means we've decided to look outside of ourselves for the quality of our being, which might be perceived by others. It's a most shallow association. It's the same kind of ire most easily invoked in Loki. This is when he kills those individuals who achieve more claim than he does. Now, these nine men working in the field, at any rate, well, they become unwilling to share. They have seemingly found something outside of themselves which might make any one of them more important than the other. And then what we all want to feel like we're something important about me. 
their selfishness is powerful enough that they care not for the injuries which they will occur upon each other. The nine months of growing, of planting, growing, and harvest die with the cold steel of winter across their throats. When people spend the short time of their lives looking outside for a blessing instead of inside for a gift, they usually become a danger to everyone around them. When they become convinced that the best thing about them is some kind of thing, institution, organization, or government, all of which are outside of our being, we lose our sense of self-worth. We lose what's valuable about ourselves. And life in general loses its value. Much like the world today, full of drowning rats, it seems that if time every man for himself, until the divine shows up and helps humanity sort the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. When the divine comes along in our lives, make sure you look inside to see if you've developed the gifts which you have been so generously bestowed upon you. The instant you begin to look outside of yourself for confirmation of the greatness or the tool, thing, or idea which will make you great in the eyes of other people, you may well find a blade to your throat or a knife in the back. The character assassination amongst these types of people takes many different forms. But it's But the individual brave enough to wander alone for a minute, brave enough to sacrifice some part of himself which is holding him or her back, they will begin to associate dang it, with other people who recognize this effort. See, we, we, if you show me your associates, I'm going to show you what your future is going to look like in five years. Show me the five people, five people closest to you, and I can tell you what your world's going to look like in five years. We, who those people we associate with the most, that's who we're going to begin to emulate. That's who we're going to be um, most attracted to. We're going to want their approval. We're going to try to develop ourselves to become more like them. And, and this, this indeed is a powerful bond between people. Once we begin to associate with people that are striving for ourselves, ones which might be strengthened with such high-minded words such as honesty, integrity, courage, love, compassion, and a host of other words which lose their meaning outside of such intimate settings. Odin sought a night's lodging with the giant who was called Balgi, Sutinger's brother. Balgi bewailed his husbandry, saying that his nine thralls had killed one another. And declared that he had no hope of workmen. Notice that the boss will not attempt the work himself. See, this is a weakness which may be manipulated. A leader would be out there in the field uh, when we begin to talk about perseverance, industriousness, and self-reliance, those are the kind of hallmarks of an individual. Well, I don't have any help, but you know what? The work still needs to be done. I'm going to go do it. This guy says, just sitting there crying about it. People like that can be manipulated. A self-important man who cannot or will not do the work for himself is easy prey. So Odin called himself Bulwerker in Balgi's presence. He offered to undertake nine men's work for Balgi and demanded his wages, one drink of Suttinger's mead. Balgi declared that he had no control whatsoever over the mead and said that Suttinger was determined to have it himself, but promised to go with Bulwerker and try if they might get the mead. So he knows he can't get it, but he also knows that he's lazy. So much like, well, a deal has been reached. There are no assurances except that Balgi will ask on his behalf. Now, this is a heck of a thing to commit to. A maybe? To do the work of nine men? Surely something must be afoot. Like I said, small-minded men who are convinced of their own importance are easily manipulated. They are most easily told what to do by men who are accustomed to being in charge. Even if they do seem to have the perception of a lower post, people will pay attention to confident individuals. Confident individuals know what they are and have no qualms about asking for it. Where do they find this worth? They find it within. Skilled craftsmen that work these trades on these job sites, they know what they're worth. Their worth is not determined by the tools in their toolbox. It's the skill in their mind and the, and the strength of their hands and their back. They find it within. <laughs> for here is a lowly farmhand, there must be surely nothing 
that he could proclaim about how great he is. These other men all killed themselves over a simple whetstone seeking to break this bond of mediocrity. But a man who has examined himself will draw people to him of all positions in life, like moths to a flame. Odin understands this limbic resonance like very few do. Here he's going to use it. During the summer, Bolverker accomplished nine men's work for Balgi. But when winter came, he asked Balgi for his hire. See, I would like to point out that Odin has put a lot of work, a lot of effort into work with keeping his word. How many of us, when we find ourselves in a distasteful or hard situations, maintain the presence of mind to realize that we put ourselves in this situation? That the best thinking we could come up with put us in this scenario. And it's a commonplace occurrence to watch people build up resentments, assume the role of the victim, become very unhappy in life because of situations that they themselves created. Whenever I hear people calling Odin an oathbreaker, I have to wonder about them. Are they truly missing the point? Or are they creating for themselves a backdoor in their thought process to justify their feelings and whatever radical actions they might deem necessary to remediate their problems instead of standing up and being honest? Usually it's the latter. If you have the presence of mind during the routine of your workday, you find yourself becoming agitated. Stop. Take a long minute to think about how you've come to these crossroads. You brought yourself here. With this kind of acceptance of responsibility for your own well-being, you can now figure out how to change this for better in a healthy, well-balanced way. For most people, this simple exercise is all that's been missing. We're still waiting on something, some else to come along and fix it for us and when they don't we're like spoiled children whining until mama or daddy comes along and takes care of it for us there are an awful lot of people sitting around waiting for something out there to fix it for them also true is that way of life which puts this responsibility right back in our hands not only the responsibility moreover it shows us how to do so and gives us not only permission to do so but an expectation to accomplish this awakening then they both set out for Suttinger. Balgi told Suttinger his brother of his bargain with Bolverker, but Suttinger flatly refused them a single drop of the mead. He ain't used it. He ain't tried it. He ain't tasted it. He ain't sipped it. He simply owns it. Like a guy that has a Ferrari. He ain't going to drive it anywhere in town. He might get a chip in the window, but he's important because he's got a Ferrari. It'd be just a little bit better than you driving your regular old Mustang. So let me see if I get this straight. Well, Bolverker made a suggestion to Balgi that they try certain wilds. If perchance they might find means to get at the mead, then Balgi agreed readily. So now all of a sudden, this Balgi's ready to stab his brother in the back. So let me see if I get this straight. Odin approached the brother of a man who had the mead locked up, not the owner of the mead himself. He did him a good job. He earned his respect and set him up for failure against his brother. Hmm. A brother whose entire ego was wrapped around owning that meat, not drinking it, or it would be gone and then he wouldn't be as important. He would be the guy who used to own the meat of inspiration. Well, that's not nearly as impressive, is it? Suttinger's ego will not let him share a drop of it. It is the foundation of who he thinks he is. Why Odin would have been foolish to try a headlong assault against such a mentality. Much like people who attempt to convince other people who is more right on the internet. But if someone else begins to perceive a benefit in knowing you, you can do two things. You can either continue to try and convince them how right you are, or you can do some work which might result in some success in their life. Most, if not all, healing authors cannot seem to grasp this. And that's why I'm in a crowd all by myself. <laughs> For Balgi, he bought in a fine harvest. His reputation and the success of his farm was maintained. That was his identity. Against all odds, how dare his brother refuse his request? Doesn't he understand what he had to go through? Who, he, What he's had to deal with? Won't he at least help him keep his word? Now ba Balgi becomes the aggrieved victim. Once again, Odin has a solution. By hook or by crook, the vainglorious man will not have his image tarnished. Thereupon, Bolverker drew out the alger called Rati, saying that Balgi must bore the rock if the alger cut. He did so. At last, Balgi said that the rock was bored through, but Bolverker blew into the alger hole, and the chips flew up at him. <coughs> then he discovered that Balgi would have deceived him, and he bade him bore through the rock. Balgi bored anew, and when Bolverker blew a second time, 
then the chips were blown in by the blast. There is always a moment to be crossed and you cannot turn your back from a course of action. Valgie thought about it. And Odin knew a lesser man would have problems committing to this effort and he covered his bases. He checked for thoroughness. When we are working with any kind of person, we should check for thoroughness and hold ourselves to the same standard. And this is especially true for work on ourselves. Are we following a person or are we attempting to emulate the principles they may be espousing? Follow those principles. Never allow your potential to be limited by someone else, even if it is the person who brought you to the dance. As soon as they see you within reach of something they cannot achieve, who knows? They might try to stab you in the back as well. Then Bull Verker turned himself into a serpent and crawled into the auger hole, but Balgi thrusted him from behind with the auger and missed. See, now Balgi knows he is screwed, and he attempts to do the right thing, but it's too late. Odin is within reach of something he has been denied. This is no different than Logi bargaining with Iduna or Freya as chess pieces in a game to save his own skin. When people are offering you something which is not theirs to give, they are doing so from a position of ego, not one of presence. It is not your well-being they are interested in. It is their own image they wish to project. Once you surpass their self-imposed limitations, old mindsets and head games once again come roaring back to the surface. This is new territory. There's new tools that need to be used, and sometimes we may not be in possession of those. Bolverka proceeded to the place where Gunlod was and lay her with her three knights. And then she gave him leave to drink three draughts of mead. So much has been said about these three knights that one may hardly encapsulate them in any style or form of writing. And it has been suggested that this Gunlod is the mother of Graugi from these three magical knights. I think it's fitting. Odin speaks in poignant terms of this relationship on more than one occasion in the lore. And if there's one thing a good bard or musician might ever do, it is to regale his audience with a tale that tugs at the heartstrings and makes us wonder, what if? This lady with the mead cup is an old scenario, appearing in many ancient tales and mythologies around the world. A serpent arrives and captivates the imagination of a woman. For many long centuries, it has represented the special magical place women have held, long held in various societies. It was only recently that this union of the feminine with the masculine divine became an evil idea. What fear prompted men to vilify this union, which is every bit as necessary as King Arthur's union with the Lady of the Lake? It is an ego-based fear of men who sought to determine their masculinity by whether or not a woman confers it to them. Women do not confer masculinity. That is the role of the men in the tribe, but I digress. Odin has secured from Gunlod three drinks of the divine mead and the blood of Kvasir. In the first draught, he drank every drop out of Ulfrir. In the second, he emptied Bowden. And in the third, Son. And then he had all the mead. These three drinks are integral parts of each other. The mead of poetry, Bowden means vessel, and Son is the reconciliation. What we say think while operating in this vessel known as the human form is the key to our ability to reconcile the vast mysteries of esoteric knowledge available to us. This is the part which was unknown to the lesser beings who simply wanted to own something special. They felt that the simple owning of the mead was enough to make them seem greater than their associates. Like the words we read that Socrates pointed out, the reading of those words does not confer wisdom. You might have read them, but all you're doing is reminiscing. Unless you've worked with a mentor, you don't understand the thousand different gestures I'm making right now that you're understanding at a subconscious level. <laughs> as we aspire to organize our thoughts into a more suitable pattern for the vessels we inhabit, we will find that there's a depth to this well we might hardly have imagined. We will also find that we are not alone. Our wanderings by ourselves might be an end once we begin to understand this simple concept. Then he turned himself into the shape of an eagle and flew as furiously as he could, but when Suttinger saw the eagle's flight, he too assumed the fashion of an eagle, flew after him. When the Aesir saw Odin flying straight away, they set out their vats in the court, and when Odin came into Asgard, he spat up the mead into the vats. These friends and initiates into the ways of Osatru know what to do, 
they willingly help one to share with all so that the whole tribe may benefit. They and we become vessels in our own right, full to the brim with imagination, equal parts stirrer of fury and stirrer of inspiration. Nevertheless, he came so near to being caught by Suttinger that he sent some mead backwards, and no heed was taken of this, whosoever might have had that. And we call that the poet taster's part. No heed was taken. It was up for grabs for anyone who had what it took to claim those few drops. Who knows how effective this is slaked the thirst for knowledge of the spiritual men of the time. Who knows if it provided that impetus for lesser men to rise to some grand occasion. Perhaps it will do so with us. But Odin gave the mead of Suttinger to the Aesir and to those men who possessed the ability to compose. Therefore, we call Posey Odin's booty and find his drink and gift and the drink of the Aesir. Odin gave the mead to the members of the tribe, the Aesir, who are now a well-rounded community of the best of the Aesir and the Vanir. It's not all one or the other. You have Njord and Frey and Freya of the Vanir, and you have Tyr and Thor and Iduna and Bragi and Sif, and Tyr, Friga, the Aesir, all of these communities that Odin has brought together to make one strong, powerful tribe. He shared with it. He gave them all that need of inspiration. See, the work that each one of them done has done through the Lord to become something more, to move beyond where they originated. They have shaped themselves into the vessels, into what they believed they could become by helping each other. And now their leader, their king, and their ruler bestows upon them a substance which will open their eyes even further. These beings with the power to affect men's lives from the grandest of scale to the most personal of loves now possess the ability to do so with a plethora of fantastic words to inspire them. Like an artist painting upon a canvas, a unique blend of the world they see and their own touch of the divine in every landscape they paint. These assembled gods known as the Aesir and the Aesir may paint upon the imagination of, of the minds of men and women to help them reconcile their daily troubles, that they move past them ever forward towards whatever destiny may be in store for them and us. But now we may do so as princes who bravely and gladly go till their day of death is at hand. We have to ask ourselves, what are we offering our tribe? But simply owning these words and simply being right is not going to be enough for us to build this into something that it needs to be. And there's a real important part to this. There's instruction given in, in this that, <laughs> how do we do that? What are the signs in the Lord? What are the words that, that give us the instruction or help us negotiate this life? Where is that inspiration to be found? Are we to be inspired by the simple acts of courage and bravery, of beauty, of strength? Well, in, in the lore, in the Poetic Edda, there are four well-known lays within the lore that cover the same thing. Why? Why is this question and answer scenario repeated? <coughs> because it is offering us a very important glimpse into exactly how the transitory nature of all life is governed for our benefit. The various transitions one must accommodate in life from growing up and getting old to the changing of the seasons to life and death itself are established for the wise to determine what is important in life and what is not. And we get lost in that. Every evening is a symbolic death of the sun. Every morning is a passage of the moon. Every fall is the death of life in the world. And Isa reminds us that though everything may be frozen, there is still a pulse underneath it all, which is more important to focus on, the pulse or the ice. Can you work with the pulse? Or should we simply be content to know that it is there and handle the challenge of living in a frozen world temporarily? This passage of time and the understanding of the seasons was of such importance to our ancestors literally all over the world, they built magnificent monuments with solstitial and lunar alignments which astound us today. Many of them also include various constellations as important parts of their design. They are so advanced that they are within degrees of alignment to true north and south, east and west, east and west. Their layout might, might even contain a mathematical calculation for the circumference of the world itself. That's not something they're supposed to know. 
Yet we hardly put two and two together when we find this important information repeated not once or twice, but four times in our Lord. Our ancestors are literally screaming to us that we should remember how a man should be during the transitions of life. When to plant, when to harvest, when to love, how to die. In the Volusva. <laughs> then Boar's sons lifted the level land, Mythgarth the mighty, there they made. The sun from the south warmed the stones of the earth, and green was the ground with growing leeks. The sun, the sister of the moon from the south, her right hand cast over heaven's rim. That's the midnight sun. It doesn't quite go below the horizon. No knowledge she had where her, where her home should be, or the summer sun. The moon knew not where his, what might was his. The stars knew not where their stations were. Then sought the gods their assembly seats, the holy ones in council held, the names they gave to noon and twilight, the morning they named and the waning moon, night and evening the years to number. The earth is made from the body of Ymir, like a spring when the sun warms the earth again and ground is covered with leeks, a life-giving and protecting food representing abundance of a sort. It is then that our heads are raised to the stars once our bellies are full and we are warm. We notice that our needs have been met. We may now pay attention to the sun, the moon, and the stars. The two go hand in hand. When to eat, the sun is here. When to start the cook fire and begin the hunt, the moon is here. When to plant, these stars are over here. All of it in alignment with the passage of time in the life of man. <coughs> At Ithaval met the mighty gods, shrines and temples they timbered high, forges they set, and they smithied ore, tongs they wrought, and tools they fashioned. In their dwellings at peace, they played at golden tables. Of gold no light did the gods then know. Till thither came giants made three, huge of might out of Jotunheim. That is Goldveg and Hyth and Horsthrauf. As men begin to hold the passage of the sun, the moon, and stars as reliable and something divinely given, for life is good if there's an understanding of these things, inspiration takes root and great things are built to mark these wondrous occasions great communities begin to emerge, celebrations are held, and the tribe is successful. Until some few decide that perhaps there did not need to be such a solemn understanding, that there was no need for such wisdom when one might simply love gold and they let it bewitch their minds. This is the evil which draws men off course. This is when we begin to look outside of ourselves to determine the value of our being when we're comfortable and our bellies are full and there's abundance. The mindset which separates them from the world they live in, one can see why Odin did his best to burn it out. In every scenario where man has separated himself from the environment in which he lives, that community suffers catastrophe untold. The world is littered with the corpses of civilizations who forgot this important lesson. Be a part of the world you live in. Do so by paying attention to the effect that the sun, the moon, and the stars have on the life around you. I'm not talking just go out and be an astrological reading tarot, there's passages of time. These things change, and we go through seasons of life. It's not, I'm masculine now, once and done. I'm a woman now, once and done. It continues to move. It continues to change. It's always changing. Be a part of that, and you will have un some understanding of what leaf and leaf is your life and the love of life truly mean. In the Vathruthness model, we find it again. Vathruthness spake. Out of Ymir's flesh was fashioned the earth, and the mountains were made of his bones, the sky from the frost cold giant skull, and the ocean out of his blood. Odin spake, Next answer me well, if thy wisdom avails, and thou knowest it, thou fruit near now. Whence came the moon over the world of men, that fares, and the flaming sun? Thou fruit near spake, Mundil fairy is he who begat the moon, and fathered the flaming sun. The round of heaven each day they run to tell the time for men. Odin spake, third answer me well, if wise thou art called, if thou knowest it, thou fruit near now. Whence come the day over mankind of the fairs, or night over the narrowing moon? Thou fruit near spake, the father of day is Deling called, and the night was begotten by Nor. Full moon and old by the gods were fashioned to tell the time for men. In this set of details, we find yet more deities. Night was begotten by Nor. The father of day is Deling, Munilferi is the father of the moon, and their efforts, the energy they have brought into the world, is necessary to tell the time for men. The energy, the power behind the governing of our lives. A second layer of divine influence is added. 
The celebrations become all the more momentous. The transitions of life for the whole community begin to take on a new depth. And these monuments which men build are now as much of stone as they are of themselves. This is when men begin to question the various aspects of their own being. What kind of children are we bringing into the world? Will our sons and daughters be those bright and shining images of successful transition in life? Will they become suitable successors of ours? Are we training them to handle the roles we currently fill? Because this is key to everything we're trying to do. This is the lesson of the Riggs Thule itself. That each generation becomes a little bit better. Each generation invites the divine into their home. And each generation becomes stronger because of it. They become more skilled. They become more successful. Until they learn the language of the birds and the use of the rooms found in their own kingdoms. In the Grimness Mall, we see yet another layer of this sun and moon. In the front of the sun does Valen stand, the shield for the shining god. Mountains and sea would be set in flames if it fell from the sun. Skull is the wolf that to ironwood follows the glittering god and the sun froth fit near. Hati awaits that the burning bride of heaven. Out of Ymir's flesh was fashioned the earth and the ocean out of his blood, of his bones the hills, of his hair the trees, of his skull the heavens high. See, because there are limits we must establish, aren't there? Boundaries which govern our thought process, lest we destroy that which we have created from the intensity of our desire to shine. That's where ego comes in. That's where men begin to cut each other's throat because of some possession they might hold. See, there are other forces which are more than ready to destroy this wonderful, destroy this world. They're more than ready to destroy those wonderful concepts of the passage of life we love so much. One false step, one half step, and the wolf would be upon them. Now we are building yet another layer of value to the sun, moon, and stars. What if we lost them? How do we know to do all those things we take for granted? Nothing has changed about how the world was created. The hills, the oceans, the trees, the heavens high are all still exactly the same. But the compass of our lives may not always be as reliable. Sometimes we may become lost. And finding our way back to the course of our life relies upon our ability to once again understand the transitions of our life. We are back to trying to understand the change from boy to man, from girl to woman. And we must once again establish when to rise and when to eat. Our world has changed so radically that the efforts of our ancestors require an enormous effort on our part to reestablish in the routine of our daily lives in the here and now. We have people selling New York Times bestsellers because they're telling people, we'll get up at four in the morning. Our ancestors did it every day. Many times they are no longer congruent with the manner in which we live our lives now, and we must return to our roots. When we say in the AFA, well, we're returning home. This is kind of what we're talking about. We're returning to these roots. We're returning to these old customs and ways. We start to once again to listen to our ancestors about what is truly important. And it's never something out there. It's never something we possess. It's almost always a focus on who we are, our deeds, and the quality of the children, the quality of people our children become once we're gone. Finding in ourselves and our connections to the divine requires a refocusing of our wills from satisfaction of outward possessions, political concepts, or radical ideologies to that of inward reflection. We must at some point begin to understand that the rest will take care of itself. We need not be at odds with anything or anyone. Once we teach our children the value of who they are, are we ever going to develop enough faith to believe that they will treasure it? Death is a part of this now. The threat of the loss of the sun and moon creates the idea that it is something to be feared. It is the first time that we get the idea that death is a bad thing. Fear becomes the motivating factor to value these divine gifts. In the first two lays, we do not see death treated as an enemy, for to them to hold holy and appreciate the course of life governed by the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now things are changing. The masses have developed other ideas, the love of gold, the bewitching of men's minds and the theft of teamwork has manifested a fear of death and a loss of the delight in life. Such a neurosis carries on to this day and it is a great wound in the spirituality of our world. 
socialism, communism, 1488, Black Panthers, the ADL, the ACLU, and many other socially aware organizations are just a few of the scars of this wound on the world and the people in it. See, all hate is based out of fear, not the value of life. The underlying message of all these organizations is that one wrong step, one half step, and the wolf will eat the sun and the moon, and we will all be lost. Politicians get elected on it every year. In the Alva Small, we find it one more time. This time we find it from the warder of men. Thor spake, answer me, Alvis, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the moon that men behold in each and every world? Alvis spake, moon with men, flame the gods among, the wheel in the house of hell. Go where the giants, the gleamer, the dwarfs, the elves, teller of time. Thor spake, answer me, Alvis, thou knowest all, dwarf of the doom of men. What call they the sun that all men see in each and every world? Alva spake, men call it sun, God, orbs of the sun, the deceiver of Dvalin, the dwarves, the giants, the ever bright, the elves, the fair wheel, all glowing the sons of the gods. And that's an interesting part to take on right there. Thor is asking this dwarf who has shown up to ask for his daughter's hand in marriage if he knows these things. We can know all kinds of things. We can read all kinds of words and believe that we have understanding. This dwarf, much like Sutting or owning the Medes, believed that the information he thought he knew made him worthy to ascend to this godhood like style and marry Thor's daughter through. But in all that knowledge, he failed to understand that if he tarried there too long, he would be turned to stone by the sun. And such, and it is with us too. We're sitting here, so much of us. When I made a post today, I challenged all kinds of people. And if you looked at the responses, you would see that the most vigorous responses against my comments were those who were threatened by the fact that I challenged who they thought they were because of what they thought they knew, just like Thor and Albus. When we begin to look at these transitions in life, when we begin to look and understand this movement of the sun and the moon and the stars, when we begin to understand the importance of the, our ancestors being a part of the world they live in, not separate from it because of what they own and what they built, but a part of it, holding it special, holy, and divine, there is a certain romanticism that falls upon it. We have a great challenge in this redevelopment of loss of truth to begin to understand that it is not some book that we've read. It is not some word we think we understand, but it is looking inside of ourselves and understanding that we are all moving on one road to one doorway, and that is death. We are all going to die someday. Are we going to elbow each other out of the way as we rush headlong towards that door? Are we going to help other people make that one final transition in a healthy, happy, loving way? Because that's the final setting of the sun. That's the eclipse of the moon. That's the blotting out of the stars. That's the end of it all. <laughs> so much of our transitions today, when you talk about death, when you talk about the setting of the sun, there's a sadness as if we've lost something, as if it's a bad thing, as if we're, we're something bad's happening. This vilification of the goddess hell, who is simply escorting Balder through to a new rebirth to a greater future. I heard it best said that death is not a bad thing. It's simply the taking off of a tight shoe. So we might become greater. Once we begin to grasp these transitions, because at every stage of every transition, part of us dies. That part that we no longer need to move forward dies. We let it die, we get rid of it, and we throw it off the bridge, and we walk on across the bridge. And that 
is what these transitions are all about. That's what this death of the sun and the death of life and these changes in life, it's about helping us figure out which part of ourselves we need to get rid of so we can keep moving forward. In today's world, when we're so confused by the possessions that we own, we forget that it's only a part of us we need to get rid of so we might grow into something stronger. Not all of ourselves. Too many people are taking their own lives because they can't figure out which part to get rid of because they're tied up in what they own and what other people think and their possessions and all of these other things. Now all of a sudden, we have also true in this world shining this great light, that inspiration, that source of wisdom and inspiration by keen eyes that we might begin to look inside ourselves one more time, get rid of that shit we don't need. Quit trying to act as if we're more important than everybody else because we've got some new secret or some esoteric wisdom and help each other move along this road that's just as hard on everybody else as it is on us. That's what I got for tonight, guys. I appreciate everybody for paying attention. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Yep, yep. Yeah, that was good. That was, thank you. Thank All right, guys. You may, if anybody didn't have any questions,